Welcome to The Opening, the place where hope is happening, with your hosts Fran Cadrone and Marina Teran Manery. For more information about Fran and Marina, or to apply to be a guest on the show, please go to our website, www.hopening.com. The Opening is for informal purposes only and is based on the research of your hosts, Fran and Marina. They, as well as their guests, are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liabilities that may arise from this podcast, which is not intended to replace any professional medical advice or care by medical professionals you are currently utilizing. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us. This is opening number 77. And we are so happy to share with you for the very first time our new theme song and introduction. So I'm very happy to have you here. And I think, Marina, we should give a shout out to your husband, Wayne. Yes, Wayne composed the song um, that we are using, and it is his voice announcing it. So thank you, Wayne, for helping thank you, me Wayne. out. And uh, mm -hmm. it's amazing to hear you in it as well. So, Fran, today we mm -hmm. are talking about memories. So tell me, what are we talking about memories about? Well, Marina, I've been thinking a lot about memories lately now that I'm retired. <laughs> and people will ask me, you must have such good memories of teaching school for so long. And I do. And, um, you know, it was super interesting because this past weekend I was in Jasper, Alberta and um, officiating the wedding of a former student. And um, I taught her in grade when she was in grade four and now she is 26 Wow. But at the wedding, um, there were some of her bridesmaids that I had also taught and some of the guests that I had also taught. So over the course of a few years, I get a lot of memories and a lot of different students and stuff. And um, some of the now adults, I mean, they're, they're not kids anymore. They're adults. They'll say, Mrs. Cajon, I'll always remember when you did this. And they'll they'll tell me about it, and I'm like, right, I remember that. I but I had forgotten it because time moves on, and as a good a good teacher will change things up because a teacher gets bored too. And um, I'll always remember how I got you know the kids. I remember how I got to dress up in that outfit and and sit at the front of the class and pretend I was this famous. Um, book character and I'm like oh yeah I did used to do that right so I've been thinking a lot about memories this week and um, I started to do a little bit of uh, looking on YouTube and looking on TED Talks and looking back into some of the authors that I've read and uh, one of the one of the TED Talks was called you are your memories you are your memories and I was like, huh, interesting title. So I listened to that one. You are your memories. And if I were to ask you, Marina, something like, Marina, you are your memories. So um, if that is a statement which is true, um, which which memories are you? Which like, what, it, what is making Marina, Marina? Because we've both got stuff that happened in our past that's there. Yeah. But what would you, what would you come up with if I were to ask you, what are your memories, Marina? What, what comes well, to I mind? Yes, a lot of my memories sculpted my personality. And I have lots of memories because I think the older you grow, the more memories you have. I grew up in a different country with a completely different climate. And it's not just about hot and cold. It's about the intricacies of that specific microscopic nature and the, the different plants that grows there that will not grow here because of the temperature. Um, 
memories of if I think about that now I would think of we never really had winter <laughs> so <laughs> because the winter I know now is is completely different I have a lot of memories of singing I have memories of fun things but I have also memories of painful things and so what I'm learning now is that I can live from the memories of my past or I can live by a vision of the future so memory sometimes in my opinion is you can become addicted to negative memories and I don't know if that is specifically what you want to talk about but I think we see that in our work so Marina I um if you talked for a couple of minutes there. So if I were to tell you uh, what are my memories? So I would say I was a little girl that I grew up on a farm with a big family. And like you, uh, some of my best memories are, you know, on rainy days or after a big rainstorm going out and my boots would get stuck because it's so muddy in the field and you know, having to walk out in my bare feet out of the field because the boots are stuck and big brothers come and get my boots for me and wash them off. And those type, you know, memories of winter and uh, shoveling snow and building snow forts and those types of memories and hoping to God that the bus doesn't um, have to run that day so you can stay home from school. and No day. And, um, you're right. You know, there's lots built on on weather. And you it's exactly like you're saying. We have we have two compartments or more in our brain. So neuroscience looks at that. What makes memories stick and what makes them go? So it's because of what's attached to it, what emotion is attached. So I've got three questions for you, Marina, and for our viewers. Are you ready? Skill testing questions, Marina. Ready? Number one, where were you on November 1st, 2014? No clue. Great. Number two, what did you eat for lunch last Thursday? No idea. And number three, how many? cell phones did you hear ringing in the past week because i'm at the cabin mine and my husband don't ask yeah. me how many times but <laughs> his <laughs> rings more than mine <laughs> right so you've got you did well actually because when i answered these questions i got zero i was hoping that i maybe had the cell phone one right but i don't know i just threw the number out there i don't know if it's right or not however if i were to ask you these three questions number one where were you on september 11th 2001 right i was delivering newspapers early in the morning because because of what happened in New York and in the U.S. and the terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. I remember getting back home, turning the TV on, and I was watching it live when the first plane struck the, the building. Exactly. And, yeah. and I, was, I was at school. I went to school and we saw it on the screens mm -hmm. and it was there. And I remember it and you remember it. Mm -hmm. Marina. Skill testing question number two. What is the first big music concert you ever attended? Are alive with the sound of music. <laughs> exactly. Made an impression, right? <laughs> there you go. There you go. And you remembered it. And mine as well. You know, I'll remember it, but I'm not going to say it out loud because <laughs> it isn't the answer to one of those questions that Revenue Canada asks you, right? It's they ask you like oh, umpteen questions just so, right, you right, right. Your, <laughs> right? just so you can get into your right. account. So I'm not going to say it, but I absolutely remember that night. I absolutely remember it. But, um, and skill testing question number three, where were you, Marina? 
the first time you had relations? The fine relations. An intimate, an intimate relation. Where were you? I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> But you do remember it, don't you? I do remember it, yeah. Me too. <laughs> okay, so what is it? Why do we remember? We were we didn't remember that one, but we remembered that date. We didn't remember the lunch we had, but you know, we remembered our first concert we went to, and we didn't remember how many cell phones or possibly how many cell phones rang, but you know, there's we remember an event such as that one. Why? Why? What is it that that's triggered? The emotional connection to it. Absolutely. Yeah. It, there's an emotional connection yeah. to the event, and it just it just it work. It's there's an with emotion attached to the event. There's actually a physical change in the brain Absolutely. where the nucleus of a brain cell sends a chemical out. It's a communication chemical, which changes that memory from short-term memory into long-term memory. Yeah. So it's the emotional connection attached to it, whether it's fear, whether it's bliss, whether it's, um, you know, excitement or whether it's fear, uh, there's an emotional connection. And so the first type you know, those obscure things that nobody really cared about what lunch you ate last Thursday. That's called a habituated memory. It's they don't mean anything and they only yeah. go into short term memory. And the other ones are called sensitized, sensitized memory. So if we um, look back on the, the memories that stick out for us, whether they're good or bad or whatever, it's because of the emotion that we attach to it. So when I was deciding to go back to university, I was taking some high, high school courses again because it had been a while since I was out. And um, I started to run in the morning. So I started to run just because I had extra time and then I would go to school and take a, a couple of courses during the day. And I found that my memory was that much better. I couldn't understand it really. Why is my memory so much better? So I way back you know I was interested in this stuff back in my early 20s and it turns out that adrenaline how much adrenaline is is going through the body also activates memories into long-term memory so we know that adrenaline is activated in cases of fear or in cases of stress or or even in enjoyment there's an, an adrenaline there's there's a rush of hormones well what does this have to do with what we do with hypnotherapy? So, Marina, if I were to ask you, Marina, what does this have to do with hypnotherapy? What does what does any of this have to do with hypnotherapy? I am so glad you asked that question because it's something I've been studying lately. There are three parts of our brain. The neocortex is the hood of your brain, right? And right now we're using the neocortex, just having this conversation and getting information in. Now, if you learn to drive a car, the first time you learn to drive a car, this information goes into the neocortex. But then the moment you start to practice it and you start to repeat it, it go into the limbic brain, the part of the brain that's right in the middle, the neocortex is here. And then the bottom here is the um, cerebellum. And so the moment you start to repeat everything that you've learned to drive a car, that becomes that's also where the emotion sits so chemically emotions something chemically happens so that you have emotions and the moment you have a little emotion you have a memory and then driving a car if i ask you fran or even walking because i know i think you live close to the school you used to see chat so if if you can walk to that school without even thinking you just know you went from point a to point b but you cannot even remember the steps you gave because it's so in your memory now it's in the cerebellum it's it's locked in there and in what we do is when a memory has a negative charge for example let's let's use something like procrastination 
somebody wants to stop procrastinating. They, we need to help them to make a differentiation between this memory in the past where every time they want to do something, let's say, for example, they want to start running. And every time they get up in the morning and they think, okay, I'm going to start running today. And they're like, oh, but I don't feel like it. It's too cold. Oh, I'm not fit enough. I'm going to get out of breath. That is the memory of the past. And the reason it is like that is because they must have had an experience at some point that made them feel like that, that where they felt too cold to run or they felt um, too unfit. or and, and so it keeps on repeating and repeating again. So if you can get them to break away from that and start to say, but what is it that I really want? And then have a vision of the future and say, okay, today, just today, I'm going to walk five kilometers and not run it. And then I'm going to increase and I'm going to have a plan. And every time when that old memory comes back and say, well, I don't want to do that again. Um, I don't think you should go for a run. To tell that old memory, no, that's not me anymore. My new me, my vision of the future, the person I want to be, want to start to get fit. I'm going to take baby steps today towards it. And so that is how change occurs. And then practice that. Practice that instead of succumbing to that to that memory of the past and practice that until that goes into the cerebellum until mm -hmm. that becomes the new habit i just want to turn my light on here just a second so so when we say you are your memories yeah. or um or you your your memories are going to be your future unless you deal with your memories so you and i we have different memories of september 11th okay. but say um say my sister and i we both played in the snow together we both you know played in the mud together we both you know we did my sister and I were so close, we're only 10 months separating us, right? We're raised at the same time. However, she's got a totally different memory of stuff than I do. And she will say what her memory is, and I will say what my memory is, but they're different. I mean, the event is the same, but the memory is different. So what is it, Marina? Why would she totally have a different point of view? point of reference than I do of the same event what would you say is going on even though it's the same time so same you can place, read the same... same news article and it's exactly the same hard facts that you observe in the article but the moment it hits your limbic brain and you have an emotional charge of what you observe your interpretation of it becomes different only 50% of what we believe to be true in our memories is the truth. I think it's even less. Possible. Possible. Yeah. According to scientists, only 50%. And a lot of times we react on that emotional charge and not on reality. And think of addiction. When people are addicted to something, it's normally to numb themselves from a memory of the past because a memory of the past if you keep on reliving that over and over and over again it becomes a predictable future mm -hmm. so then when you say i don't want to go for a run because it's going to be too cold yes it's going to be too cold then you have the excuse and a lot of people don't deal with the memories of the past i keep on expecting for it to come back and back and back and back so they because they something. created Right. They've created their belief right. system. Right. Their belief system has been created about their memory, which there's a fifth. If you if you're saying it's 50 50, it could be true, but it might not be. Yeah. Right. So memory is the glue that holds your mental life together. That statement memory is the glue that holds your mental life together. That statement came out in 1952. I can tell. That's I would change it. 75 years ago. Yeah. 75 years ago. 
a man named Eric Kandel. He was a neuroscientist, worked out of Harvard. He knew it back in 1952. Be careful of your memories because your mental state is held together with your interpretation of your memory. So if the same event, if we, if our take on that event was, yeah, my parents hated me, my parents hated me, they treated me poorly, Mm -hmm. my sisters and brothers picked on me all the time, it was so unfair in our household, Uh, certain kids in my family got everything and I was like the ugly stepsister, whatever, Or your memory is mom and dad did the best they could with what they had. Uh, Yeah, we were poor, but, you know, we made we made good use of it. We had so much fun in the winter. Uh, I just loved getting stuck in the mud because (laughs) it was fun. It was different. If those are my emotional memories, if that's the emotion that I attach to that, then my reality of my childhood is so different than it could be my sister who I grew up with, because this is the memory she's holding of of a really negative experience, whereas mine is a really positive experience. Now, I agree that there are negative experiences that children go through. No child leaves childhood without something impacting their childhood. But um, it's what you what you do with it after. Right. And um, you and I both have seen it. We've both seen it in our practice. And I think that one thing that that we can, we do so well is give our client a different perspective of that event, whatever that event is. So now that rather than looking at it from the inside of that child who was there and interpreted it with a certain emotion, now they can look at that event with an adult's eyes and see the whole event for what it really was. And we can change that belief that they had around that event that that made them uh, in whatever whatever frame of mind that they are in today. Yeah. So we, uh, memories can be both good and bad, right? So um, I think it's important to differentiate because I do have a lot of pleasant memories, but it's when the memories becomes something that keep on repeating itself in in your reality as a negative. That is when we really have to make the choice, and we all have choice, whether we, we want to keep being stuck in there or do we want to create something new. And I mean, if if you look at relationships alone, how many how many clients have you seen who, who have, take yourself, myself as an example, who had a very bad relationship before and then... I had trouble to get to groups to it doesn't have to be like that again so they remember the bad from the previous relationship I can I can give you a great example Wayne and I moved in together 11 years ago and the weekend we moved in together both my boys as well as his daughter had a wrestling tournament and I um we moved in on the Friday on Saturday was a wrestling tournament and he said to me go I've never missed a wrestling match. Um, And this was Timothy's first one and last one. And um, (laughs) 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 it was not a wrestler. Anyway. He's um, not a PhD, so it doesn't matter. No, no, that's John. That's John. John is the PhD. Tim still does amazing. But yeah, it it was a a hard moment. Like, yeah, no, you don't have to do everything your brother does. Just don't do this. You're not a fighter. (laughs) Anyway. Um. But I was sitting there and wrestling, when kids do well, you stay there for the whole day. It's not a quick thing and it's over. If they don't do well, it's like over and you go home. Now, John was really good. And so we would stay there until the very end. And uh, so um, I'm sitting there and, and I started to get really nervous because in my previous relationship, I would have been in so much trouble for not being home to help Wayne unpack. So that's my memory of the past. So I got nervous, Mm. nervous, nervous. And eventually I got somebody to come and drop the boys off at home or the kids off at home. And I went back 
And I went home and Wayne said to me, what are you doing here? And I said, no, I felt really guilty for not helping. He said, why? Your kids come first. And it hit me that I was living in the fear of a previous experience, a previous memory, that this it was over, that part of my life was over. I now had the freedom to do what I wanted to do. So I think that's a great example. And I think that's the kind of things that we see in our work. Um, why do people get stuck? What does that have to do with memories? It's the re it's that pattern, right? It's the and the 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 mind will give you what it thinks you want. Right. So if you want to be safe, it'll remind you subconsciously that it's not safe to stay at the wrestling match. It's right. not safe because you're going to be in trouble when you get home. So I better make Marina nervous. I better make Marina aware. She better get home. Because otherwise, she may not be, she may not be safe. So let's keep her safe. So talk about looping thoughts. Mm. Uh, what is looping thought? What What is a looping thought? And what does it have to do with memory? Mm -hmm. So your looping thought is that recurring voice in your head that is telling you um, whatever the situation is, whether it's I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not the same as everybody else, so I don't deserve it. I I'm incapable of getting it um, because I'm not I'm not as capable. I'm stupid. I'm right. ugly. I'm too big. I'm too little. I'm too short. I'm too tall. I'm too whatever. I've never had it before. So what's what's the what? Why would I get it now? Right. All of that right. that looping thought that keeps. It keeps you stuck. It keeps you. It keeps you um, just rotating around the same thing. So let's, never... let's talk again about that thought goes into that new cortex of the brain, and then the moment. So a thought creates an emotion. Mm -hmm. An emotion creates an action. The moment that thought becomes an emotion in the limbic brain, and. Let's go back to the wrestling incident. I was okay until I had a thought, oh my gosh, what if Wayne is angry at me? And the moment I got, I thought that thought, I had an emotion of fear and I was anticipating a bad outcome. And the moment I had that, it started to snowball. What if this? What if what if I'm jeopardizing this new relationship? What what if this? What if that? Looping thoughts. Oh my gosh, I better go back home. And then I acted. I left the wrestling to go back home, to act on that memory of my past, to act on those looping thoughts. So how do you change that? Mm -hmm. So you change the belief. <laughs> change the belief the belief because the belief decides the action you take the action you take creates a new belief or continues to create the belief right so do we want to get out of the looping thought the looping belief will you change the belief or you change the action you have to change it somewhere in there you have to change one of those uh cause and effect right. to change what happens so the next time you went to a uh -huh. to an event with your uh, where your children were at probably your brain your mind tried to tell your brain you're going to be in danger you're going to be whatever you're going to be in trouble you're going to your husband's going to be angry and so you probably spoke to your brain and said well that's just a thought because I know that he's not going to be angry right? because exactly. that's just the thought. It's exactly. not reality. So there are a few things that we can do in situations like that. There are a few things that we can say. For example, during our sessions, we teach our client to say, that's not me anymore. And you can say change. You can say stop it. 
You can say, give your head a shake, what, whatever works. You can say, snap out of it. So it's, there are so many tools that we have today. And I mean, this is a very, very simple example. There are so many more um, debilitating thoughts that people have. And what are some examples that you have seen of people stopping their progress at work, in life? What are some thoughts that you have seen? I'm too old, right? There's the I'm too old one, or um, I was never good in school, that one. Or I just, I am not a public speaker. I'm not a public speaker. That's the last thing I'd want to do. Uh, I'm just no good at it. So for myself, um, I have those types of beliefs too. Like you talk about, um, ah, it's too cold to go for a run. I mean, the hardest thing about going for a run, Marina, is getting your feet Sorry. over the side of the yeah. bed. Yeah. Really, that's the hardest thing. The hardest thing about going for a run is putting your shoes on. Because once the shoes are on, it's not hard at all. But to convince your brain, it's right. like, you know, I'm no tired this morning than I was yesterday morning. And the shoes are only 20 feet away. Um, to catch that thought and to, and I mean, that's just a simple, a simple thing. You know, um, whatever it is, you know, I, I have this little, it's called shift. I, I, it's called shift. And so it's an acronym. Acronym. S-H-I-F-T. So be sensitive to yourself. What is it that you're feeling? Ooh, I feel a bit of anxiety there. Then H. Where's the, Where do I hear it in my body? Hmm. Do I, is that anxiety in my throat? Is it in my, my solar plexus? Where's the anxiety? Hear it. Okay, let's, let's take a look and, and hear whatever it is it's trying to say to me. So eight, uh, that's S and H. I is intuit. Let's get into it intuitively what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel a bit of fear. I feel, okay, let's hear it. Yeah, I'm a little bit afraid. I'm having some people over tomorrow night. I'm a little bit afraid of how it's going to go. Um, okay, so you're you're feeling it. So you've got some fear there. It's okay to have fear. You, it's okay. You're going to, you're going to do well. It's, Fear is an acceptable emotion. If you're going to have people over, what should we do about it? Well, let's just do the best prep we can and just take it from there. And so shift and then snap out of it, snap out of it and move on. So you give that part of your body the attention it needs. You hear it. It's all it's trying to tell you. It just wanted, it wants to be heard. Hear it. So it's, uh, what was the first one is? Be sensitive sensitive and then hear it, hear it. and then being in, intuitive into it. and intuitive. then feel it if it's feel it feel it and the team. and transform it transform it transform. i love it that's yeah. awesome yeah. shift it's as simple as it is whether yeah. it's yeah. worrying about the guests that you're having think of how of awareness so if you are if you can be aware of your thoughts and of your memory Mm -hmm. of the past how can you change your future same thing right so i mean if if i'm going to be afraid of whatever it is or anxiety over it mm -hmm. i look at my emotion and i address that emotion right i address it and find it i find it where it is in the body and if you need to, you can touch it or you can just find it and give it the time it needs to express itself. I'm afraid because when I had that dinner party before, uh, you know, we didn't have enough food or we had too much food or we had whatever. I'm just afraid that that's going to happen again. And then I accept it. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That did happen that time. But since then, you know now that blah, 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 and you're going to be just fine. So that also makes me think of living in the moment. Yeah. Because if we live from the memory of the past, 
it would make you anticipate a not so pleasant outcome in the future. So what about just being in the moment? What are your go-to points about being in the moment? Yeah, you know, find your, like, there, find your feet. You've got your feet on the floor. Feel your bum in its seat. So you don't have to, like, touch your bum, but you're just taking the time to feel your feet, find your bum in its seat, and breathe. Mm -hmm. Breathe is a very, very good thing to do. And breathe. And if all it takes is 17 seconds, mm. just 17 seconds. Okay. So um, in the present moment, I always say that is a new, a new term that people use these days. That's flow. That's yeah. you're in flow, you're in creation, you're in the zone. And for me, is in that place, it has to bring, you have to bring in an element of fun, of enjoyment. It just makes it so worth it. So um, if I want to write a new article for a magazine and I'm procrastinating in doing it, I like to be creative. So I change the way I speak to myself instead of, yeah, I don't know if I have really anything good to say. And I say, no, actually, I love to create. I love that I can get the opportunity to create. I, I'm so blessed that I get this opportunity to write for a magazine. I can create. So it's just so exciting. And suddenly I turn fear into excitement. And now I start to get excited because, oh, wow, I cannot wait for this article to be published. Now I'm excited. And now I have a vision of the future. I don't live from a memory of the past. And all of that happened in that place of in between, in between the past and the future. It happened in the now. In that magical moment of now. That's where you create wonderful things now. And it's so important to, you know, at the end of the day, or I always write my gratitude the next day, uh, to have a gratitude, have gratitude, make a list of what you were grateful for the day yeah. before. And it can't be like the trees, the sky, the grass, yeah. forget it. It has to be something specific and why. So if you, because that builds the good memory, yeah. right? If you don't want to die with a bunch of bad memories and everybody remembering you as such a negative person will remember the good stuff and write it down write that good stuff down yeah it rained yesterday but that gave me an opportunity to do some research on memories nice so i didn't love get to rain go, i love rain <laughs> right? but not everybody you know like yeah. after you've had two inches and one hour you kind of wanted to stop but I mean when I listen to the rain on the roof that sound of the rain on the roof or when I you know that because the rain it rains so much I'm blessed that I didn't have to worry about watering the lawn or the whatever it was so you 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 build a gratitude list out of what you're grateful for and you just if you can't do it just do the best you can. Do the best you can. Have because... you ever put something that you're grateful on that you are still creating? No. Try it. Because <laughs> Dr. Joe Dispenza says that gratitude is a state of receivership. So, for example, if you create um, a sunshiny day today and you or tomorrow, and you start to imagine that the weather is going to be perfect. Let's say it's your wedding tomorrow, and you want the perfect sunshiny day. If you start to imagine yourself in your wedding dress, being outside, and the sun is shining, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and then you start to say, I'm so happy and grateful that there is a big chance that it will be the perfect day tomorrow. And try that. Try mm -hmm. that. That, yeah. that is and just write such, it out. Yes. Right. 
write it out. That's an important thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that before. Definitely. I do it every day. But, um, and, and this is another thing. Uh, if we end up 110 years old and we've all got a Alzheimer's and we can't really remember what we, what did happen, at least we'll have these created memories of stuff that we just wrote down, which never really, you know, maybe I'd never got to be the, the best seller on the New York Times list. But if I wrote it out every day, that that's what I'm going to manifest. But <laughs> if you do I mean, your best. At 110 years old, I'll remember that I was the best seller on the New York Times list. So, I mean, who wouldn't want that? Right. Exactly. I created my reality, whether it was true or not. That's wonderful. Well, this was insightful and fun, Fran. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Any last words on memories? Yeah. Memories create beliefs. And beliefs create our actions. And it's just a revolving circle. And if you act one way instead of another, you will change that whole cause and effect system so one of those things have to change either your actions or your beliefs or your memories yeah one thought at a time one thought at a time excellent well thank you so much fran and thank you everybody for joining us today and watching opening number 77 we will see you next time all right